Jeff is a licensed marriage and family therapist, a relationship educator and coach with over 20 years of experience. He is the co-author of Love You, Hate the Porn, Healing a Relationship Damaged by Virtual Infidelity. Um, he's the host of a weekly podcast called From Crisis to Connection and has produced workbooks, audio programs, and online courses helping couples and individuals heal from the impact of sexual betrayal, unwanted pornography use, partner betrayal trauma, and rebuilding broken trust, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, Jeff's presentation is titled Rebuilding Trust, Guidance for Couples on the Brink, where he will help you get clear on exactly what you need to do right now to start repairing your relationship, understand why your partner, why your betrayed partner is responding the way they do, learn how to create healing conditions where trust can grow, implement strategies for the immediate aftermath of broken trust, develop and develop long-term patterns for maintaining trust. Um, Today, the, the chat is turned off, so please hold your questions for the Q&A session um, for the last 15 minutes of this webinar um, and use the Q&A Q &A feature when the time comes. Um, you can feel free to write down your questions now if they, as they pop up so you don't forget them, um, but please just save them for the end. Um, and this workshop is also approved for one continuing education credit. You can email me at marriagecommission.usu.edu to request a certificate. And I'll, I'll repeat that email um, when we get to the end. Um, and please fill out the survey at the end of this webinar as well. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff, for being here with us today. I'm so excited to hear from you. And I know everyone else is too. So I'll just let you get started. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be here. And to talk about something that I just love talking about, a lot of people wonder, why would you like talking about broken trust? Because I'm really interested, I'm actually really interested in repairing trust. Um, and I'm very optimistic about how that can happen in our most important relationships. So let's just dive right in. Um, broken trust is extremely expensive. Um, if you think about um, what happens when we don't trust somebody we don't know, um, and I'm thinking about, um, you know, if, if you're going to buy a car or if you're going to um, do a deal with somebody, it just takes a lot of effort back and forth, a lot of time, oftentimes a lot of money, sometimes attorneys get involved. When there's not trust involved, everything is just extremely expensive and costly on so many levels with energy, time, money, everything. And, and really, it, it, trust is everything. And it's really important to, um, to recognize that if there's not trust, things just move at a snail's pace, if they move at all. And once trust is established, then everything seems to be easier. I, I, all of the couples I work with, they'll say things like, you know, it's like, all I can think about is my broken relationship, or I can't get any work done, or I'm just totally struggling with, um, you know, being the good mom or good dad that I want to be because the broken trust just consumes all of our energy. And we need trust to operate in the world. I mean, I think about just driving through a, a traffic signal. Um, when we're driving along, we trust that the light's going to turn um, red when it says it's going to turn red and that everybody's going to stop when they're supposed to stop. And of course, that trust can be broken. And then there's, uh, there's trauma and fear. Um, same with food. We put a lot of trust in food manufacturers and restaurants and others who handle our food. And Sometimes that trust gets broken and it creates a lot of problems. And most importantly, though, in our, in our closest relationships, when our, when our relationships are secure, when there's deep trust and we really know that this person has our back and we don't have to look over our shoulder anymore, everything in life just feels easier. And more specifically, everything feels less scary and less overwhelming. And that's really what we're looking for here. So in this presentation, I wanna talk about what to do when trust is broken and then how to start rebuilding that. And I'm gonna speak specifically to the person who has broken the trust. And then of course, the person who's been betrayed and then talk about in a couple's context, how they can work together to heal the relationship. Let's just do some definitions real quick. Um, what broken trust is. Most people know what trust is, especially when it's been broken. It's kind of like, well, what's trust exactly? Well, you know it when you don't have it, right? Because you feel cautious and, and scared. And when you have it, it's just a feeling. Sometimes it's really hard to describe. But when I think about what trust is in my marriage, 
or in my closest relationships, I know that the other person is concerned about my well being. I know that they are going to act with my best interest at heart. And I know that they're going to keep their promises. Um, I know that they're going to live up to the expectations that we've agreed on and that they know and care about um, what's important to me. And so with that in mind, trust then, of course, becomes the foundation for any healthy relationship, allows us to be vulnerable, to let our loved ones see more of us and feel more secure in the relationship. And when that's on board, we really can talk about anything. I often will tell couples, um, you know, they get worried like, oh, we can't talk about money or we can't talk about um, sex or we can't talk about religion or politics or things like that. But almost every single person can identify someone they have felt safe with and someone that they feel like they can be totally themselves and they don't have to watch their back or feel guarded. And when that's the case, then they can actually talk about these things very easily and very openly. And that's what I want for you in your most important relationships. And today I'm going to be speaking specifically to committed, long-term committed relationships, marriages. That's why we're here to talk about the impact of trust on marriages. So this stuff applies to all relationships, but you'll see specific application to your, your intimate uh, marriage relationship. So when, when trust is broken, basically it's when one person puts their needs and desires ahead of the other person's. Um, when the other person is less interested in what's best for you or the relationship. Now, I recognize that sometimes trust can be broken accidentally. Um, I think about the very first time I broke trust with my wife in my marriage. Uh, we've been married for almost 26 years, and it was a couple of uh, days or weeks after we got married. It was within the first week or so. Uh, we were on campus, and we ran into um, my ex-girlfriend. And um, I was, you know, newlywed. I was just kind of like deer in the headlights. I felt so uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do. I, I wasn't thinking very clearly. And I was caught off guard and just was talking to my ex-girlfriend. And my brand new wife is standing right there, feeling totally stupid and invisible. And I was completely ignoring her. And, um, you know, was I some evil genius masterminding the situation to hurt my wife? Of course not. I just was an immature um, clueless, overwhelmed, 20-something-year-old um, trying to navigate an uncomfortable situation I'd never been in before. and But I still had to do a lot of the things we're going to talk about today to repair that trust with her because she was wondering, um, you know, is this person a threat? What's going on? What do I mean to this guy? And our marriage was so young and there was a lot of mistrust um, and insecurity that we had to work through. And so trust doesn't have to be broken on purpose. In fact, many times it's not. Um, a lot of people are not waking up, figured out how they can betray their partner's trust. However, the moment that you recognize you've broken trust or that you've kept a secret or that you've acted in a way that goes against your values, at that point, there are choices. And in many cases, that's when the deeper trust is broken. It's almost like most people can understand that we're all going to be human and we're all going to do dumb things and make mistakes. Like my example, my wife didn't hold on to that. It wasn't a big, big, deep betrayal that took us years to overcome. It was something we could work through. But if I had done something else where I was purposely concealing something or contacting my ex-girlfriend and talking a bunch and going behind her back and carrying on with that, that's where the intentionality, that's where the 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 willfulness gets involved and that's where the trust is where i'm that's where i'm now putting my own needs ahead of the needs of my partner and my relationship and so when you break promises when you violate important expectations marriage vows uh, commitments promises um and there's patterns of that even so it can be something as simple as or common as like just not showing up on time and your partner can just say, you know, I love you, but I don't trust you. I don't trust that I can count on you to show up when you're going to show up all the way to major deal breaker type betrayals that really can throw a couple in crisis, like infidelity or financial betrayal. So broken trust, you know, is common in, in relationships. We make promises, we break promises. None of us want to, 
most of us are doing the best we can with what we understand. And we have a lot of instincts, reflexes, blind spots that can get us into trouble. And so it's really important for us to recognize that, um, that this is not usually coming from a, uh, a mean-spirited place, but we'll talk about intentions in just a little bit. But what, what matters the most is that we live a relationship where we just learn how to repair and that we are actively engaged in undoing the damage that we create, regardless of our intention. Okay, so let's move on here. Um, when trust has been broken, and I'm talking about bigger trust than just um, some of the examples I gave, like showing up late or things like that. I'm talking about deep patterns or big experiences, big events that are that are huge, right? Something like an affair only has to happen once for it to put a couple in crisis, where other patterns might happen so much that all of a sudden it just kind of wears you down. And one day you wake up and you're like, I do not trust this person at all. And those kinds of experiences, um, you know, it's almost like one is sort of like, water torture with the drip on the forehead and the other one feels like a nuclear bomb, but they're both destructive and can cause tremendous damage. So most people's tendency is when a marriage has been betrayed is to go right into marriage counseling. And while I'm obviously I'm a marriage counselor, I've been doing it for a lot of years, and I believe in, in the power to, to work with a couple in my office and help them, a lot of traditional marriage counseling isn't going to help um, oftentimes the way that we go into it. So if, if we're going into traditional marriage counseling from a place of like, uh, we just need to communicate better, or we need to, um, you know, just work on rebuilding our, our relationship and go on more dates, whatever, to rebuild trust. The truth is, is that when there's been a major breach of trust, when there's been something that's really fractured the foundation of the relationship, we're not on an equal playing field, a level playing field. There's not equal power anymore. And so if you're just going to focus on communication skills, you're oftentimes going to be setting up both partners as having equal responsibility. And the, the truth is that one person has more responsibility than the other to repair the broken trust. Excuse me. I have a little cold, and so... And so when you put people in a situation like this with... Um, communication skills, or just trying to work on the marriage like it's a level playing field, you oftentimes can do what, what we call victim blaming or making the injured partner feel just as responsible, which is super damaging. Even though there can be relationship cycles that are really hard to break, even when there's broken trust, like you could have one partner who's really hurt by the broken trust and they become violent or they become really angry and abusive, that happens and those things have to stop. Of course, those things are not going to allow the couple to heal at all. At the same time, there has to be a tremendous amount of compassion. There has to be understanding for what they've gone through and why they're acting the way they're acting. So these are complicated situations, but recognize that just going in and trying to fix it on the level of just both of us aren't getting along when there's been a breach of trust is going to make things worse. We want the person who's broken the trust to step forward and take accountability for the impact they've had and for the injured partner to understand that the broken trust is not their fault. If someone breaks trust and chooses to conceal things or to keep things in hiding, that is never the fault of the injured partner because uh, they may be responsible for other conditions in the relationship. They may be responsible for um, creating stress or other challenges, but the actual breaking of trust is an individual choice and responsibility. And so, the fastest way to, to stabilize a couple and help them is for the person who broke the trust to take personal responsibility and acknowledge that there is that difference. Does that difference need to exist long term in the relationship? No. Is there, is there acknowledgement down the road that there's things going on back and forth in the relationship? Yes. But there's always this sense in the relationship. There's always this acknowledgement that 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 injury is the responsibility of one person, even though both people can acknowledge and recognize that there were conditions that created other stressors. Hopefully you can see the difference there. It's really important that, that there's accountability from the moment that they try to repair the relationship and forever. That's very healing and very secure for the relationship. 
Now, when we're talking about trust building, it's really hard. You can't, as a, as a therapist, as, a, as an educator, you can't guarantee that what you tell somebody to do is going to rebuild trust because that involves another person deciding to be open to receiving the trust or believing that person. Sometimes the damage is so severe that trust can't be rebuilt. And, and so there's no way to you know, control or guarantee or manipulate someone into trusting you again. However, you can, I can guarantee and you can promise yourself that you can learn how to live a more trustworthy life. And you can learn how to create the conditions that will make it easier for the betrayed partner to uh, trust you. And so when we talk about living a trustworthy life and creating conditions, that is 100% within your control. That is something that you can start working on today and forever. What your partner does with that is totally up to them. And that's a really vulnerable, difficult thing, because in many cases, um, you, if you've broken the trust, there's been some level of you being in control. And that's a hard reality to face. And what, what I mean by that is, for example, if I've kept a secret from my, from my wife and I don't want her to know and I've lived this double life, well, I've been in control of her reality. And I've been able to guarantee that I can get a certain response out of her, right? If she doesn't know what I'm doing, then she's going to probably be really nice to me versus if she learned what I was doing, she'd be really hurt and upset and treat me differently. So that's the kind of control I'm talking about. So let's talk, I want to talk to the person who's broken the trust for a little bit. If you're the person that's broken the trust, the when you're caught or you come out of hiding or you open up about it, it's very natural for you to go into panic. All of a sudden, everything's changed, right? There's a loss of control that I just talked about. There's a lot of chaos in many cases. Uh, sometimes you get kicked out of the house or there are some, some big boundaries that are set or your partner just doesn't want to see you or touch you or talk to you. It's really important that you don't panic. That's way easier said than done. I totally get it. However, it's coming from a place of you now being afraid of losing that relationship or your reputation or your control or your security. This is tough. And recognize that your partner is also reacting strongly because they're also now facing the fact that they might lose this relationship. This relationship is important to both people. And in most cases, the reasons that there has been concealment and hiding and other kinds of things is just because you don't know how to manage closeness or intimacy or relationship stuff. And so there's a lot of reactivity on both parts. But the truth is, is that your ability to not panic, your ability to stay very calm and stable and accountable, which is huge, is going to make the biggest difference here. If you become an emotional wreck and your betrayed partner now has to manage all of your emotions and keep you from going off the deep end, then it's going to be a much longer road back to repairing trust. And so sometimes when somebody is caught or they come out of hiding, they can start becoming so dramatic and threatening suicide, or they can start um, breaking down and sobbing uncontrollably and just wanting their partner to comfort them or feel better. And that is a really terrible strategy. That is not going to make things better. And so recognize again that even though you may have made a mistake, or even if you were concealing things and, and controlling the situation, this is not your moment to be comforted. It is your partner's moment to be comforted. You've had a chance to deal with your reality and you mismanaged it. So I know I'm speaking very directly, but it's important to recognize that this is a betrayed partner's moment to have all the big emotions. There will come a time for you to sort through your stuff, but it's not going to be with your betrayed partner. And the, one of the worst things you could do is to gaslight. This word's been used a lot lately. Sometimes it gets misused, but basically gaslighting is when you know the answer to something or you know what's going on, but you kind of play dumb and pretend you don't know. And your partner is left to, to believe some other reality. It's very manipulative. It's very controlling and very damaging. So this is a time to just be honest, open up and, and tell the truth. This will save you so much time and money. Um, and if you have secrets, if you have a prolonged period where you're telling secrets and keeping secrets, you're going to need to go through what we call a full therapeutic disclosure, a full disclosure. It's going to be mandatory for there to be safety and trust in the relationship. You can't just give partial truths. You can't just, um, you know, keep continue to manipulate and 
disclose or dis deceive your partner. You can't continue to manipulate and deceive your partner and expect things to get better. So recognize that when you're coming out of hiding and you're revealing secrets and you're, you're starting to open up your world to your betrayed partner, you're not only going to be causing a lot of pain because of what you did, the behaviors, but the biggest pain for your partner is going to be the secrecy, the concealment. As they say, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. I also heard another way of to say it's better to be kissed it's better to be slapped with the truth than kiss with a lie. And so most people can handle the truth. It's hard, it's brutal, but it's pretty regulating to our nervous systems because we at least know what we're dealing with. We do not do well when there's concealment and hiding. We go crazy. So let me talk about impact versus intention. In the beginning, there's gonna be a lot of panic and energy like I talked about. And there's sometimes going to be a focus on wanting your partner. I'm still speaking to the, to the person who's broken the trust. You're going to want your partner to know it wasn't your intention or you didn't mean to. That's a very common response because you want them to know that you're a good person at heart and that you care about them. The way you're going to let your partner know that you care about them is by owning the impact on them. It's going to be owning the effect you've had on them, their emotions, their physical health, everything else. They are absolutely, they're absolutely not capable of caring about or even taking in your intention. So this isn't the time for that. Is there a time down the road where your partner might be able to care about your intentions? Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that where they can really learn and hear and care about um, what your thought process was and so on, but it's definitely not in the beginning. Impact is the only thing that matters. Um, I see that I've, I've totally lied to you. I see that I've just ruined your, your life, your day, whatever it is, and just really own the impact. I'm gonna read something from Brene Brown. She said, owning our story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult as spending our lives running from it. Embracing our vulnerabilities is risky, but not nearly as dangerous as giving up on love and belonging and joy the experiences that make us the most vulnerable. Only when we are brave enough to explore the darkness will we discover the infinite power of our light. And so it's really critical for you when you're trying to rebuild trust, as we say, to own your story. Step into that dark place that you've not wanted to look at and it will start to open up light and it will be the birthplace of belonging, connection and all these other things that will make your life and your partner's life so much more stable. Okay, so there's really two questions when you're the one who's broken the trust. There's really two questions that I want you to ask yourself. Do I want to get well? And number two, am I willing to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes? Those are hard questions. And they're both yes and no questions. And so recognize that if you're gonna put all the excuses aside and just really work to rebuild this trust, it has to come from a place of desiring to get well and undo the damage and, and do it for, uh, for as long as it takes. And my rule of thumb is that it takes way longer than we think it does. Um, most people want this to be quick and done and it's just not going to be like that in most cases. Another thing that you want to do if you're the person that's broken the trust is you've got to learn how to regulate your nervous system. You've got to recognize that um, you're gonna need support from other people to help keep your, your nerves calm so, like I said, you do deserve support. It's not like you're going to do this in isolation. In fact, that's a terrible idea. But as you learn to talk to others and open up for support, and this can be a church leader, this can be a therapist, this can be a group of other people uh, that are safe. It can be people, generally people with um, similar experience. So a lot of people go to like 12-step groups or a therapy group, or they'll go somewhere where they can um, get, get some accountability and some support. This will help you deal with your partner's pain better because you'll have a chance to talk about what you're going through and you'll also be able to develop empathy and not just be stuck in your head all the time. Taking ownership is very difficult. It's hard to face, but it will get rid of a lot of that dissonance in your head and it will create more peace and regulate your own nervous system. So make sure that you're doing that and taking care of yourself so that you can show up for your partner. 
And then of course, it's important to, as we say, stop the bleeding, right? You've got to stop the harmful behaviors that you've done. If you've, if you've hurt your partner and whether it's an addictive behavior or some pattern or some blind spot that you've got to look at, it's really important to go beyond just changing the behavior and do that deeper work. It's kind of like trying to build a dam against a raging river that you know, uh, you've know you not been able to stop upstream and eventually the dam's gonna give, it'll overflow, it'll break. If you just keep putting walls up and trying to stop the behavior, that'll last for a while, but you've gotta do deeper work. So don't just try and get out of trouble, do the long-term work of trying to rebuild the uh, the long-term trust. Okay, so that that's uh, that's my message to the person who broke their trust. I'd like to turn the attention now to the betrayed partner. Excuse me. Okay, so we're going to turn the attention now to the betrayed partner. A lot of traumas are physical, um, of course, like accidents, war, natural disasters, things like that. But all trauma is psychological. And so when we're dealing with betrayal trauma, we're dealing with not only the psychological trauma, but also the physical impact. And so even though you can't see um, often, you know, what's happening, there's not, you know, in, in some cases, there's not physical damage. Um, overt physical damage like broken bones or, or black eyes. And certainly domestic violence can be one of these betrayal traumas. But if we're talking just about a secret life or about um, other kinds of betrayals, those, those scars can, those wounds can be very invisible to outsiders. And, but they're no less serious or, or traumatic. And um, in fact, when there's infidelity or uh, sexual betrayal, the research says like over 70% of the, of the people that are sexually betrayed experience uh, meet the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, which we see in soldiers or survivors of natural disasters. So this is often getting minimized um, and it's hard to detect because again, there's not a lot of physical symptoms and a lot of times partners themselves don't even know that they've been betrayed or they've been uh, traumatized. <laughs> a lot of the times um, betrayed partners don't know they've been traumatized. And so um, the violation of trust from someone that we are counting on is really where, where betrayal trauma is so painful. Um, if I'm traumatized by a natural disaster or by some stranger, that's awful and that can take a long time to heal from. But when it's, with, when it's from somebody with whom the, the, the victim is relying on or trusting or needing for support and survival, then it's, it's terribly disorganizing and overwhelming to a degree that um, many people just don't understand. Um, people that have been betrayed, they dissociate, they, they feel split, they feel crazy, they feel so confused. And a lot of the times uh, they can even block it out of their conscious awareness just to try and survive and preserve the relationship or minimize the damage. It's just something that we have to take very seriously. But at, at the core, it injures the attachment. And this is why trust is so hard to rebuild because you're basically putting your life back in someone's arms that um, that was supposed to hold you up and they they didn't. And so if you understand primary attachment, it's, it's a survival instinct. It's not immaturity. It's not regression. And, and the idea that we shouldn't depend on others or that we should just take care of ourselves goes against basic biology. And it's it's not true. That might be true for strangers or for other people we're not close to. But all of us have a primary attachment bond with one person in a romantic bond and that person helps regulate our nervous systems and our breathing and our, our hearts and, and our emotions. And that's a healthy thing when it's done in a balanced, healthy way. And when it's broken, it's very dysregulating and throws off everything. It's hard to eat and sleep and breathe. And it's not because you're, it's not because you're uh, immature that you're regressive or that you're, um, um, that you're just uh, immature it's because you're, you're trying to get your emotional balance back, your physical balance back from this, this person that was supposed to be your, your, your connection, your regulator. So a lot of the common betrayal trauma responses are you know, anxiety, nightmares, avoidance, panic attacks, mood swings, flashbacks, denial, being overly sensitive, depression, overeating, rage, health problems, chronic fatigue. There's just so many. And it's so critical that we take this seriously and not minimize it. Okay, so a lot of times um, partners get ignored in this process. There's often a flurry of activity and rebuilding trust, getting the person who broke the trust to be more trustworthy. 
But really what needs to happen is a combination of the person who broke the trust, obviously getting themselves stabilized and doing all the things we just talked about and getting support, stopping the behavior. But the betrayed partner, they need support for their physical system. They need safety. They need to know that they're not crazy. And so doing this in the company of other people who are loving and safe and stable is, is critical. We're dealing with a trauma here in the same way that after a car accident, you wouldn't just try and sit down and try and process verbally what's going on and what happened. You're just trying to get them a warm blanket and, and help them uh, take care of their physical needs. When you're dealing with betrayal trauma, those physical needs, because the car accident's not over, right? A car accident is a one-time event, and then you're dealing with all the aftermath of it. But when you're living in a betrayed relationship, every single day feels like a car accident. Every single day feels like you're not sure if you're safe. And so taking care of your physical needs is critical if you're the betrayed partner. And that's going to happen through um, making sure that you're getting adequate rest and social support. And of course, taking care of yourself with food and and sleep and all these things that are so difficult to do during this time, but they're critical. And so do what you can, you know, stretching, yoga, um, reaching out for support, connecting to others, journaling. There's just a lot of things to soothe and calm your body. And if your body's on fire and you're totally activated and you're having a hard time calming down and you can't figure out why you're not thinking clearly or you're not able to communicate very well, it's probably because your body is too activated. And so we want you to, to find safety and, and peace as quickly as possible. And sometimes that's going to come through boundaries and it's going to come through setting limits and trying to structure your environment so that you're safe. And again, depending on the scope of the betrayal, uh, that, can, that can be so different for every person. But you need to know that you have options. You need to know that you have choices and, and ability to, to direct your life. Um, and so it's also critical to make sure that in terms of safety, if there's been any kind of sexual betrayal, make sure that, of course, you, you get checked for STDs and some of these really difficult and embarrassing things, humiliating things. But you want to make sure that you're safe and that you don't have long-term health consequences. So breaking out of isolation is critical for anybody who's got a dysregulated nervous system. And when you're, you're dealing with... Um, trauma, you're dealing with a dysregulated nervous system. So connecting to other people, since your partner who was your co-regulator is not available anymore as a safe co-regulator, you've got to open up to safe people, people who aren't going to gossip, people who aren't going to just take sides and make your life more difficult. It's just important to find stable, uh, wise people, again, groups, therapists, people that can just help you uh, make sense of your, your experience and help you recognize that you're not crazy. Getting education is huge as well. Thankfully, in 2022, there's a lot of resources online and groups and resources to help you understand what you're going through and, and get the support and education that you need. Education can help you be validated and feel less crazy and get a lot of the support that you need. And then I do want to talk about boundaries for a second. I know I mentioned it earlier, but um, a lot of the times, you the only way you're going to calm down is by having some kind of a physical boundary. So Sometimes you may feel like you need a little space from your partner. Sometimes you might ask them to be a little closer to you. Both of those are actually pretty normal. Um, you may need to cut some things out of your life. You might need to um, you know, have some limits around things you're willing to talk about unless you're with a therapist or that you just need to take some time. Uh, there's just all kinds of ways that you might need to set up limits and, and, and so in your life just to be able to have the support that you need so that you don't feel like things are chaotic. Um, this is an important time to learn how to say no and, and how to just really take care of yourself and trust that other people are going to be able to handle themselves and handle what you need as well. So it's critical just to honor your thoughts and your emotions and, and know that you have the ability to self-determine, self-direct your life and ask for what you need. A lot of the times it's hard to trust yourself, trust your judgment, trust your own instincts because you feel so uh, silly or stupid or just, you know, just crazy. And the truth is, is that um, you're not crazy. You've just been betrayed and, and you will get your sanity back either through the work of, of rebuilding trust with this person or by uh, having to take care of yourself and moving away from that. But, you know, the relationship depends on the other person rebuilding that trust. It's not just you trying to suck it up and, and move on. Okay, yeah, this is not a time to pretend. 
this is not a time to um, go along to get along. It's, it's important for you to ask for what you need and honor and pay attention to what your body is telling you. Okay, so really quickly, if you're the if you're the person that's broken the trust and you're trying to figure out how do I support my husband or my wife or you know whoever you betrayed, uh, recognize that they may not want your support right away. Recognize that they may not trust you to give them any support. They may feel like um, that you know you're not a source of comfort to them because you're the one that broke their safety and trust, and so they may want distance. Um, and so supporting them in that is actually a form of rebuilding trust and respecting them. And it can signal to them that that you're a safe person if you're not entitled and, and it, demanding that they turn to you for support. So just make sure that you're getting yourself grounded and that you're you're doing your work to make sure that um, you're there for them when they need you when they're ready for that. Okay. Um, so as far as um, taking care of yourself. Um, well, let me move on here. I just want to make sure I get to the, the couple stuff here. Um, it's helpful when you're the person who's broken the trust. It's helpful for you to become educated on betrayal trauma so you can better understand what they're going through. And you're not treating them like there's something wrong with them. You're not feeling like they're crazy or unhealthy. Um, you're just able to have more compassion and more understanding for what they're going through. So it's really important just to become educated about trauma. Uh, it won't seem so confusing to you about how they're responding. One way you can do that is just stay accessible to them. Err on the side of closeness. Just be present. And this requires a lot of patience and not making this about you and, and what you need. And you also want to be responsive. So if they some days they may want you close, some days they may want you far. And if you can just be flexible and move with them, that will make all the difference in the world. And then you start creating a safe connection with each other. And I've seen people that have just honored and respected those boundaries and stayed, stayed away and given space, and that can rebuild that trust. Or their partners wanted them to be close and talk to them more or be more physically close, and they've done that. And the, the key thing is when, you, is when your betrayed partner is asking for one thing one minute and then ask for another thing another minute, to not accuse them of playing games or mind games or manipulating you, but just to move with what they need because they're in a place where they need a lot of options and flexibility. And sometimes they'll need space, sometimes they'll need distance or closeness. So, and it's also important if you've broken the trust to do everything you can to decrease their physical and mental load, whatever they've got going on in their life, their, their work, their housework, their, their, their domestic stuff, their parenting, just do everything you can to make their life easier because they're already now carrying a whole nother thing they have to process. So you can just do what you can to anticipate needs and try and not be extra demanding on them. Now, let's talk about disclosure for a minute. One way that you can stabilize the relationship, and I mentioned this earlier, is doing a formal therapeutic disclosure. I'm not going to get into that. This could be um, an hours long presentation on disclosure. It's very involved. But I'll just say if you've kept secrets, if you've been deceiving your partner and they don't know what the truth is, you're going to need to do some kind of a formal disclosure. I highly recommend you work with a therapist, someone that can guide you through that. There are workbooks and structured ways to do it. And it's really important for you to um, do this just one time. Just tell your story once instead of trickling it out or dripping it out over time. It's very destructive to um, keep teaching your partner that they'll never really know the full truth. So this is not something you want to just do kind of do it yourself or um, try and wing it. So let's talk about healing the relationship now. Now recognize you can't make your partner trust you. We've already talked about that. You can't keep manipulating them or controlling them or demanding from a place of entitlement or a place of expecting them to be on a certain timeline. That's about your own discomfort. That's about you having to tolerate the struggle of not being trusted, which is really uncomfortable. And again, if you were keeping secrets, you were trying to create conditions where you would be treated as if you were trustworthy. So now where you're not trustworthy and there's this open where, where the truth is out and your partner sees that you're not trustworthy, this is where it's important for you to just take that personal responsibility and allow it to be, as we say, what it is, right? It is what it is. You're not trustworthy. So if you want to influence the situation, that's something you can work on. You can influence it 
by keeping your word, by being consistent, by working your own healing process and doing these other things I've just been talking about. Influence is about conditions. It's about sending constant signals that you're a safe person, that you're committed to this relationship, that you care deeply about their healing, that you're not making it about you. And you know what conditions feels like. You know, when you walk into a football game, the conditions are electric and there's a lot of energy and there's a lot of noise and, and, and you know kind of if you feel the vibration of it or when you walk into a church, it's very peaceful and very quiet. Those are conditions. So ask yourself, what are the conditions in your marriage when you've, after you've broken trust? Are they tense? Are you brooding? Are you pouting? Are you pulling away? Are you anxious? Are you demanding? Are you safe and patient and open and accountable? That's what I'm talking about. You've got to create conditions where healing is most likely to happen. I worked with so many people that have, re that have broken trust and they're like, I'm doing every single thing you've asked me to do, but their attitude is terrible. And so it's really important for them to recognize that their influence and their energy and the conditions they're creating are as important as anything they do. And so those have to line up. Again, recognize that when you're trying to rebuild trust in a relationship, transparency is everything. It's really hard to prove you're not doing something anymore. So if you've had a secret life or you've broken trust and they're wondering if you're still doing that thing, it's very difficult to prove you're not doing that anymore. So you've got to show your work. Just like in class in school with you know your math teacher who's saying, how did you get at, how'd you get that answer? Well, they're going to look and see if you know how to do the work. They're going to look and see all your calculations and your thinking process. There's a very similar pattern in rebuilding trust. Just like with a credit card, you have to spend money to build credit. They need to see that you'll pay it back. Uh, your partner needs to see that you're doing the work. And that can look like um, opening up, talking about your process, letting them know and see that you're doing something instead of just saying, everything's fine. I'm doing great. Well, most of us know that things just don't change overnight, especially if there's deep-seated patterns or a big injury happened. A lot of things that created that need to be addressed. And so you've got to show your work. You've got to do a lot of things to prove and show that you're changing and that you think and speak differently. There's lifestyle changes. All of these things are going to matter big time. And compassion is huge here. Again, if, if you're coming from a place of um, irritation and blame and you're feeling like you're the big victim and it's taking too long, it's going to make it really hard for your partner to feel like you care about their pain. They need to know that you are going to stay in a compassionate, apologetic mindset for life around this issue. Now, does this mean that everything in the world will be your fault because of what you did? No, that's not healthy. And that's, that's an overreach for sure. But when it comes to the things that you broke trust with, that's a lifetime commitment to be compassionate and be understanding. 10 years from now to be able to say, yeah, I totally did that and hurt you instead of are we ever going to stop talking about this? Or why do you keep bringing this up, right? So we want people to know that they're going to be safe. Betrayed people need to know that they're never going to be blamed for this. Okay. All right. Let me just share this last thing here, and then I'll take some questions. So one thing that is, I think, a secret weapon in a relationship where you're rebuilding trust is the attachment bond. Now, this can be, of course, this is why the, the bro broken trust is so painful because of that attachment bond, but you can also use it once there's been a certain level of safety to actually heal the relationship and accelerate the healing. Now, if there's not been a full disclosure, if there's not safety, if all the things I've been spending all this time talking about are not in place, everything I'm talking about right now is not going to apply. So please keep this in context. If you've not done these other things, Leaning on the relationship as a main source of healing is not going to work. This is something that's reserved for later on in the process. And if you're creating safety and you're accountable and you're doing all this stuff, the, the attachment, the connection of the relationship is actually going to help you accelerate your healing. And so when there's broken trust, of course, there's separateness. There's been secrecy, lies, distance. And a lot of the times people will kind of go to their separate corners to try and heal and heal in isolation. Well, as humans, we don't tolerate isolation very well, and we actually become more distressed by it, both the person who broke the trust and the person who's been betrayed. 
And so what needs to happen is the more you can start turning toward each other, again, after safety, after disclosure, after all these things are in place, and start to open up about your experiences, start to open up about your process. You start to open up for support from a place of, I need emotional support, or you know, I just wanna share my world with you and let you know how I'm doing, not from a blaming or from a critical or victimizing kind of place, but from a place of just letting your partner see more of you. This will start to create more safety and start to help co-regulate the relationship. And this is not easy to do, but it's often it's like severely underutilized. So many times people will heal individually, but don't know how to come back together. And the way people start to come back together is to recognize that each of them has an impact on each other. If I'm the one who broke the trust, me telling the truth and being open about what I did starts to calm down and help my betrayed partner feel more secure. If I'm the person who uh, was betrayed, um, as I start to like, listen and take it in or let myself be influenced by their efforts and their work it actually starts to create a lot more calmness in my in the person who broke my trust and you may wonder well why do i care about whether they're calm or not well this is part of rebuilding the secure uh, bond rebuilding intimacy and closeness and connection this is how you bring two people who have been working really hard back together so long-term couples work is really about understanding the impact you have on each other and recognize that that there are deeper emotions and feelings and apologies and um, ownership for all kinds of things that impact each other in the relationship that can really help you feel more secure with one another. Again, this is really important to, to make sure this stuff's happening long-term and that the whole relationship isn't just held hostage by uh, betrayal. If the relationship is never really healed um, because there's not been the disclosure, there's not been accountability and ownership, and there's not been trauma work and all this other stuff, then obviously you'll never get to this, but you'll also never really heal together as a couple. You'll just, it'll just be really hard to heal and do any kind of long-term work. And so I really want you to know that long-term healing as a couple is possible. And these individual things I've shared for what you can do as the person who broke the trust and the person who has also been betrayed can then start to come together as you start to see that you're having an impact on each other, that safety and openness and accountability and ownership and all these things can start to stabilize the connection. And then you can use that as a platform to start reaching for each other and rebuild that secure connection. Um, the research on sexual betrayal, which is what I specialize in, says this process can take a few years to fully feel secure again. It doesn't mean you can't start to feel better within months or even weeks as you start to be honest and, and secure, but it doesn't mean that there'll be full, secure, bonded trust um, in, in a weekend or after even six months. It's going to take some time, which is good news that it means it can heal and that there is healing available to people. Um, but the, the difficult news for a lot of people is that it's not going to be as quick as you'd like it to, but you can still um, feel close and secure and help each other out along the way as you're doing your individual and your couple's recovery work. So thank you so much for um, having me here to talk about this. I'd love to take some questions. Um, and so let me let me pull up the Q&A here. Camilla, I assume that you'll turn that on so I can see that if people have questions that they want to ask. Yes, you should be able to see the questions. Um, I'm sure we have a couple people probably typing in some questions right now. Um, and just, just to, as a clarifier, use the Q&A button instead of the chat because the chat's disabled. So um, yeah, the Q&A, you can get your question out and you can also um, indicate um, an anonymous question. So you have the option of like marking yourself as anonymous if you don't want your name attached to the question. That's great. And thanks for putting up with my cold. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm just gonna start going through some of these. Do you have resources for ecclesiastical leaders of what their role is and what resources each person needs, et cetera? Um, so I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and so I'm, I'm mostly familiar with my own faith 
um, the resources there. Um, I know that the, that the LDS church has a lot of resources on their website. Now, whether or not an ecclesiastical leader uses that resource or not is obviously up to them. But I know that there's videos that I'm in that I've, I've, I'm explaining a lot of these concepts on the church's website. And there's a lot of resources available. So they're out there if, um, if they seek them. But of course, um, you can also take it upon yourself to educate them if they're, um, you know, if they're open to it. Um, sometimes, you know, they um, might want to know how they can be more helpful. And so don't be afraid to share the resources that have been helpful to you. Um, I know that that's a big deal. Another, um, uh, another resource for, I know that I, I just interviewed a guy on my podcast, Daniel Weiss, who's with the Brush Fires Foundation, uh, just a couple episodes ago. And uh, he, his whole ministry, he's, he's a Lutheran gentleman out of Minnesota, or out of Wisconsin, rather. And his whole thing is to just teach um, the churches all over the, the nation, the world, how to deal with sexual brokenness and provide resources. So they have a lot of resources, too. Okay, so I've answered that question. How can we work with a spouse who wants to be intimate sexually, but the betrayed partner does not feel safe with them and has limited sexual relations? Yeah, great question. When there's been sexual betrayal, in order for us to, especially for women, women in healthy sexual relationships are still in a more vulnerable position sexually than men are. Um, we know that physiologically, there's studies on this, that women have to overcome um, just in general, um, a sense of uh, a threat, even with their committed partner to know that, that they're safe, that they're loving because um, it's just a more vulnerable experience for women. When there's, and so you have to feel relaxed and you have to feel safe. You have to feel secure that you trust this person and know this person. So sexual relations after sexual betrayal um, are totally up to the person who's been betrayed. Um, sometimes you'll want sexual closeness as a way to feel secure, to feel close. Sometimes you'll need distance and you'll need just to do non-sexual touching or no touching. Um, there's an incredibly important principle, which is you have to be able to say, say yes Sorry, you have to be able to say no before you can say yes. So if, if, if you're saying no and you're getting the silent treatment or you're getting punished and all these things, then, then your partner who betrayed you um, has to do some more personal work to be a safer person. Um, the goal is not sex. The goal is safety. And, it's, and if you've been betrayed, it's, it's your safety and you get to decide when you feel ready and open to, to go there. And uh, there's no timeline on that. And there, one day you may feel open to it. The next day you may change your mind. And that's not manipulative. It's just you trying to figure out where your safety and your connection is. Um, and so this is not a time to go along to get along. This is not a time just to, to believe, especially when there's been sexual betrayal that, oh, if I don't have sex with them, then they'll, they'll cheat or whatever else. That's, that's just not your responsibility. Uh, their, their responsibility is to be sexually faithful and to be accountable and, and, uh, own what they've done. And so you holding boundaries, you speaking clearly and, and owning where you're at and um, not letting somebody talk you out of that is critical. So hopefully that was helpful for you. Um, okay, the next question. Yeah, it's a great question. Can you explain the attachment bond on how to come together again? What's the first step? Yeah, coming together with the attachment bond um, you're already attached to each other. And when there's been a broken attachment, um, sometimes it can be so severed that you don't, you know, you just don't even want to be around this person or ever see them again. In my experience, that's more rare. The more common is um, I'm so deeply hurt by you. And so you're a source of pain to me, but you're also my source of comfort. So you're kind of two things to me. And so recognize that the, the, the first step is acknowledging that that other person is two things to you. So they're not they're not all bad and they're not all good. They're, they're both things to you. So um, there will be places where you do actually trust them. You probably might still trust them to, let's say, drive the kids around. You might still trust them to make your food. You might still trust them to live in the same house. So recognize that there are places, and also for the person who broke the trust, to recognize that there's lots of places where there's still a bond, where there's still a connection, and to just honor that and, and acknowledge that. 
it may not be, I'm sharing my deepest feelings with you or we're having sexual uh, connection. It may just be, I'm, I'm still here and uh, I'll go on a walk with you or so, so that what you're doing is you're just nurturing the, the existing attachment, what's still there and building from that. So I hope that that answers that question. It's, this is, this is an opportunity for you to um, acknowledge two realities that create some tension. I'm hurt by you, but I'm also comforted by you. And um, I'm going to allow both of those to be true right now. Okay. Great questions. You guys are awesome. Um, what if a partner refuses to do a full formal disclosure? Do you have more inf info somewhere regarding the formal disclosure? Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm um, boy, let me just think about that for a second. Let me just answer the one question. If your partner is unwilling to do a full formal disclosure, then that's kind of a disclosure to you. You get what I'm saying? Like that's information. If they're basically like, I'm not going to tell you everything. I'm not going to do it. Well, they're kind of telling you everything. They're telling you that their safety, their comfort is more important than yours. Um, now, there are some, some caveats to that. You know, if, if you're threatening divorce and you're, if you're done with the relationship, then I don't encourage people to go through a formal disclosure with their partner if there are there's attorneys involved. I mean, that just, that's just uh, not advised. But if there's if you're doing it to rebuild the relationship or you're trying to feel secure and safe again, then you deserve to know the truth. And if they won't do that, you have to decide what you're going to do with that information of, of them not telling you. Um, and if they swear they've told you everything and, and you either have some questions or discrepancies, then then, you know, you have to decide if you're going to hold that boundary or not. And if that means something to you, uh, this is such a challenging thing because. Um, most people that have kept secrets and are dealing with that kind of stuff generally have not told everything right out the gate or they've told um, pieces of it. And again, I'm generalizing. Um, so I don't want you to, uh, to go back to your partner and say, well, Jeff says you haven't told me the whole truth. Every case is different. But in my experience, when I'm doing disclosures with people, there's always more than they think there is in terms of, oh, I, I should have disclosed that or, oh, I didn't realize that like I should have included my accountability for lying and hiding or yelling at my partner. So, so the disclosure is really about taking ownership for all the ways you've damaged the trust and the relationship. So there's always something to disclose for sure. Now, more information on disclosure. There are some great workbooks. Um, uh, Dan Drake, Janice Caudill on Amazon. You can uh, look up there. They have a series for partners and betrayed partners and the person who needs to disclose. So look, you can look that up on Amazon, Dan Drake. Um, I'm also in the process of building some disclosure resources for couples. So stay in connection with me um, through my website or just check my social media and, and I'll, I'll make, be making announcements for disclosure resources. Um, even though I like people to do disclosure through therapeutic support, um, some people just absolutely don't have access to, to a therapist or someone who knows how to do that. And so we want to at least give people some resources that they can at least get organized and, and maybe even then do it in the presence or the support of someone who can help them. But if, but you know, with, with telehealth and other things, you can usually find somebody who can walk you through a disclosure. So hopefully that's helpful to you. Um, okay. So Camilla, that's all the questions that I see on here. I don't know if I missed any. Um, no, it looks like that was all of them. Um, okay. So we're good and just right on time too. Perfect. Um, so perfect. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank you so much, Jeff, for this super educational, informational um, presentation. I, I truly uh, love how unique, um, like just how much you know about this specific subject. And I think it's so, so helpful that you were able to like really dive deep into the, all these like burning questions that I know a lot of us who struggle with um, these questions have. So this, this has just been absolutely super helpful. And thank you again, everybody, for your participation um, yeah. to make this really meaningful. Um, all right, do you have any final words before I close off? No, I just love that people are here listening and learning. And um, I'm, I'm just a very hopeful, optimistic person. I know that um, th this is not something we want to minimize, how difficult this is. And how serious it is, but um, couples can heal. People can heal, and 
Um, if you've got two people who are really digging in and doing the work and 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 so on, it it will get better. The research shows it. My experience shows it. So if you're here and you want to get better and you're working hard at this, stay with it, please. It's worth it. Thank you so much.